Hi everyone. Um, I work for a company called Unit ZX and NS Science. It's like a startup in Eastern. And um, as Matt said, I was got really into laser scanning and photogrammetry while I was doing my masters. Um, to start with, it's kind of before getting into the science of laser scanning and what it can do and how it applies to architecture. Um, while I was coming up with these slides, I just thought it'd be worth just having a, a look at measurement, just generally, um, to kind of ascertain the size, amount, degree, uh, using an instrument or device marked with standard units, and also address the importance, effect, or value of something. And um, we're quite lucky, really, that today we have a fairly kind of structured unit system. Um, if you look at the measurement systems in, like before, there's just a huge array of different things. Um, like a shaftman, a gunter's chain, a span, a nail, all these like mad um, aspects of trying to work out how big stuff is um, has developed over thousands of years. Um, from like the earliest cubit, which is like your forearm, you, people would measure like, yeah, it's 15 forearms or, you know, it's, it's just mad like looking at it. And we're quite lucky really to be in a position now where we've got mostly um, a metric system. Um, I think there's three countries in the world that don't use it. Um, the US, we kind of use a bit of uh, it without the roads. And then I think it's um, Myanmar and another country in, in Africa. But it's kind of most of the world's using this system now. Um, and instead of measuring your arm, these days we use a kind of neon laser with helium um, kind of measuring the speed of light through a vacuum. So like the technology's just gone so far from kind of measuring a stick and calculating how big stuff is. Um, but I, I'm quite fascinated by that and um, I thought it worth touching on it before we get into uh, this side of like surveying and these things that apply to kind of architecture. Also surveying and mapping has, you know, transformed over the years. I mean, nowadays you've got your phone, you can literally go anywhere and it's completely accurate. Um, but a thousand years ago, this was the kind of human perception of the world. And it's, it's kind of amazing how it's developed. And um, it's something that I'm really into, um, mapping side of things. So what is photogrammetry? Um, it's basically the science of making measurements from photos. And it's only been around since kind of photography has developed. Um, and ultimately, it's based on kind of projective geometry. Um, and I was reading up on it to try and understand a bit more about the actual mechanics of it. And it's pretty uh, in-depth maths, which isn't my strength. But um, this image down here you can, on the left, you can kind of see that um, that's a painting um, of St. Jerome in his study. And you can actually create a 3D model just from one photo. Um, if you use the correct equations and mathematics, you can basically create space from just single images. Um, the photogrammetry that is used in architecture, though, is more with a kind of um, three, four, or what they call N view. So you have an array of different photos and you stitch them all together. Um, so I thought I'd just mention kind of the, the kind of basis of, of what it is. Um, this image of, on the left is what people were doing to stitch photos together in the 50s, which looks really intense and I don't even know how you'd use that. Um, and now there's something called the Google Tango phone, which has got dual, photo, dual cameras on the back, and you can basically 3D scan uh, a space just with your phone. And you know, I think Lenovo have, have um, developed that. So that's kind of how quickly it's moving. Um, and the other method is laser scanning. Um, and that's where you've got a big expensive bit of kit on a tripod, and it will just shoot millions of rays of lasers to, to bounce back a um, coordinate, and it will tell you exactly where it is. And I've done more with this, but I've done elements of photogrammetry as well. Both um, techniques are quite cool, and that's kind of why I got into it, is that it's, it's fun. This is an example of a, Le of a Leica. So it's just a um, big piece of kit on a tripod and you just set it up and get it running. I wanted to just explain a bit about how I got into this, and it's um, my design research project is called Activate, 
And the, the project was just trying to ask what happens if vacant land, um, vacant space on land goes online. So the idea was to find out about vacant sites, laser scan them, and put them on an internet web platform. And I did a prototype for my MRH. Um, in a lot of ways, the urban dwellers disconnected from land, often buy food from the supermarket, disconnected from governance, from land use planning, and are aware of this huge derelict land banks and derelict buildings everywhere. But no one really knows how to engage with that. Um, and I was looking at a, a kind of organisation involved, and they talk about the rise of participatory planning and how you can get people to engage with governance in the city, um, particularly using artistic techniques um, and participative methods. Um, a couple of years ago, it was in the context of David Cameron's Big Society, which has now kind of seemed to be scrapped, but um, that was the context of the project and the theoretical kind of position. It was a lot of um, critical theory as well. These guys are all kind of quite radical, left of centre, urban kind of theorists. Um, and one of the main ones that I looked at was Michael Deserto, who talks about tactics and strategies. So you could say strategy is a top-down plan from a base where you've, you have the resources and you have the wealth to be able to come up with a plan. And a tactic would be the art of the weak, where you've got a lot of time, but you don't have space. So you could say tactics would be squatting, for example, and strategies would be maybe urban planning from a council headquarters or something. And the project was basically just look at derelict sites, use emerging technologies, and then potentially see what meanwhile and, and social, environmental, economic benefits could happen. And this was it. It was just to connect the end user with a site through an active, through an active web platform. And the idea was using a map. Um, so I explored different mapping techniques. And it did touch on surveying as well. So as an architect by training, I put the surveyor's hat on and the GIS hat and the planner's hat, which is something that I enjoy doing as well, not always staying in the realms of your kind of um, comfort zone. I did a freedom of information request uh, to the council and said, where's all the empty buildings? How long have they been derelict for? And how big are they? Um, and I used that as a design tool to inform the project. They then sent me back a spreadsheet of all the empty buildings. Um, and I then plotted that using ArcGIS. And here you can see the different crosses and the locations in Bristol. This was 2015, two years ago now. Um, and I've looked recently, and they've, they have changed quite dramatically. Um, but there was 200 sites at that time. I then went to some of these sites and managed to borrow a laser scanner and scanned a big, uh, big, big area. Um, and this one was in St. Philip's. I did two scans. And this was with Point BIM, who were a surveying company. And they were very generous in helping, helping me out. Once you've got the scan, this was the first time I'd ever done it and I had a lot of help from them. You get a really rich three-dimensional model with full textures and elevational heights, everything. And if you're wearing a fluorescent jacket like I was, then you get plastered on the wall, <laughs> which is a bit annoying. But uh, The second scan for this project was at the M32 DIY skate park. Um, and I met another guy who um, was generous and lent letters. He helped me and um, brought his scanner along. This one was um, a bit more survey grade. It's called the Leica C10, and it was, I think it's 60 grand. So I was quite lucky to have help from them. And as you can see here, this is the kind of like um, resolution of the spaces that you get. Um, so you can see all the skate ramps and all of the kind of different levels and surface. Um, and the great thing about this is that the M32 DIY spot is, is a completely changing environment. So you go back there now, and this will, be, this will be gone. So with laser scanning, you can really get a kind of fragment or an archive or a time shot of that moment, which is really cool. This is the kind of final map that I produced. 
um, and it integrated laser scanning, GIS, and geolocated tweets. So if you were on Twitter and you did a hashtag of activate, um, there's a vacant space here, um, it would show up on the map. Um, and that was kind of the, the end result. And I was presenting it in the, in the studios there. I've got like 70 people on there. <laughs> but it's quite interesting using websites and web, um, you know, you can use analytics. And with Google Analytics, you can find out lots of information about who's going on your, on your, um, on your website. Um, this is the main project I've been working on. Um, I'm lead designer for UnitDX. And we are providing a new science incubator for Bristol. And we're a small client team, and it's our first project. So I came straight out of uni, and my friend Harry, um, who's a scientist, Harry Destiquai, he said, Pat, just get, we'll get a laser scan. Um, we're just going to just do it and just survey it. So this was, this was the first time that I did it on my own. <clears throat> and I was a bit scared, because I didn't know what I was doing. But as you can see in the image there, there's a few spheres on the floor. Um, and they're used for registration. So you kind of do one scan, move it, do another one, and the, and the spheres kind of help with the registration process. So this is the location of the site. Um, bottom right is Unit DX. It's right next to Motion and part of St. Philip's, which is also part of the Enterprise Zone. So this whole part of the city is really going to transform over the next 20, 30 years. Um, and that's one of the key reasons why we went for this site, because it's really well connected to the station. Um, Set Squared is the local um, kind of economic incubator. Um, and it's a, it's a great location, really. These are some of the renders that I've prepared. It's just uh, flexible office space um, and um, flexible laboratory space as well. So looking back at how those scans turned out, basically just did 21 scans and um, stitched them together painfully over about two weeks, not knowing what the hell I was doing. Um, you need a big computer as well, because, um, yeah, I've got like, I think it's 64 gig of RAM you need to be able to process all of the information. And um, there was a lot of days of just not knowing what I was doing. But um, day by day, I kind of stitched it together and it, it turned out okay. So that's the warehouse space. Um, one of the key things that I've done is um, using this point cloud data and then putting it into Revit so that we then have an accurate model uh, of, of the site. And so I prepared all of the drawing information and surveys and proposals in this process. So point cloud goes straight into Revit and then you can model it and trace it from there. And I thought it was a really good way of doing it and it saves time because you don't have to keep going back to site and you can just go into the model and measure. As you can see here, the plan, you can see elements of the green and the cars and stuff like that. Um, and I was a bit worried that it wouldn't, it wouldn't register co completely accurately. But we did get an external topo survey, and it did just hit bang on. So it was, it was good that that worked. Um, and it's quite cool with the trees as well, because no, no one's really going to draw the trees in that level of detail. Um, and here we use, it's, it's quite a basic warehouse. But you can see the trees here um, in, informed our planning application and showed that some of the areas of ventilation were going to be shielded by them. Um, and it's quite interesting. It had like a bit of a standoff of the planner who was saying that why I drawn the gantry was wrong. And I was like, it's not wrong because it's accurate to like two millimeters. And we had a bit of an argument for a bit. But in the end, um, the laser scan won. Another project that I've, um, I did while I was renting out this was the Stokes Croft. Um, I've lived in Bristol 10 years, and I've spent many a time hanging around here. And I, I, I love the, the, the part, of, part of town. Um, it's really changing, and it's, it's moving fast. And um, people say it's gentrified. And it, yeah, it's transforming. So this was done two years ago. And you can even see some of the changes since then. Um, there's a Banksy. I've got a video as well that I wanted to show you of that, of that site. So you get a lot of like noise, and you get like people in the road, and you get the graffiti. Um, you get all the shops. Um, 
you just get everything and it's all a bit messy and you can clean it up. Um, but this, this is a big point cloud. Got Slick's chicken there. <laughs> I have been there before, um, regrettably. But um, yeah, it's, it's just these places are probably going to be gone soon. Um, and, and the road is, is moving on. I mean, you've already got this uh, meat liquor place on the corner here, which is a kind of global chain for like kind of hipster burgers and stuff. But that used to be DHS, which was an old shop. So you can, this is a kind of archive in a way of Stokes Croft that back then. And um, it's, it's really interesting kind of tool to see what the city was like. Um, and, you know, the canteen, that was, that was derelict 10 years ago um, when I moved here. Um, but it's a really rich way of kind of looking at the city and seeing what's going on. Yeah? So, where does the colour come from? So, so the, the point cloud, this is Chris Chalkley, he's um, a local artist who's been, been promoting Stokescroft for, for a long time, and he was really interested in the scan, so he stood right in front of it, and this answers your question. Um, the scanner creates a 3D laser beam point cloud, and then it takes a panoramic photo, and it etches the RGB values onto those points, so that's why you get people stuck on the wall, looking like absolute mentalists. That's one of my favorite uh, pieces of graffiti, that wave. Um, that's really cool. I mean, you get all of the stuff. You get the shoes like hanging on the, um, on the wires. And um, I've been trying to like explore animation, because it's probably the best way to show what's going on. But all of this can be put into Revit and drawn orthographically. Um, but in some ways, you don't need to redraw it all. I mean, this is the main contentious scheme at the moment, the carriage works. That's been derelict since 1989, and it's got planning, but I think because of, um, because of uh, Brexit and stuff, the developers might be pulling out. But um, yeah, so it's just a really interesting way to look at the city. I mean, not many people would have a laser scanner just randomly to scan Stokes Croft, and there was no, I wasn't, wasn't getting paid by anyone, I was doing it for fun. But I think it's, um, it's a good way of analysing and observing the city. Moving on to um, the photogrammetry side of things, um, I was working with Matt a bit, at just looking at uh, one of the M Arch projects, and that was where he sent me a drone footage uh, video, and then I just um, sliced it up into a series of frames and then was able to create a point cloud in a similar vein but maybe not quite um, the same route. So yeah, that's it. You cut the drone footage up into scenes, extract the frames. I use a software called Photoscan. Um, and you can see here like each, um, each frame has got a normal and you can kind of gauge how it's, how it's working out. And you get really cool graphics. Um, and it doesn't take that long. Like that would, it's a different type of style of like media, and it's not quite so common. But I quite like the look of that as a kind of graphic um, style. And that's the top view of, of that small section. Another one that I looked at was the um, Kowloon Walled City. Uh, I recently went to um, uh, China and. I don't know if you know about the Kowloon Walled City, but it was basically the biggest uh, illegal kind of uh, emerging like settlement in, in the world, I think. It's just, con just been built on and built on and built on. It was an undefined piece of land in Hong Kong. And this is a model of it. Um, and I think at one point there was like 40,000 people living in this like block. Um, and there's some amazing drawings of it online. But um, I just quickly had a little go at seeing if I could make a model of that. Um, and again, you get this kind of cool uh, input of images and it kind of uh, creates this, this model. You can see here it's not quite working, but um, you know, as an as a initial stab at it, it was quite, quite good. I've also got a video of um, the M32 DIY that I wanted to show, and it's not quite as high, high res, but it was, it was still quite interesting. This being the more expensive video as well, uh, scanner as well. 
So for some reason, the, the, the scan came out green, um, but it was still had all the, all the kind of geometry and all the space. But that's, that's just been developed over time. Um, originally, it was just uh, a really quite sketchy place in Bristol uh, that's been kind of grassroots, community-led regeneration. Um, and you can see there's like sofas and there's, you just get all the detail in there. And it's a really, really interesting way of, of exploring. Um, I think the skaters were a bit unsure about what the hell we were doing. But um, yeah, you can see all the little ramps and things. So I think I've actually rushed through that much quicker than I thought. Um, so um, yeah, if you've got any questions, please do, do ask. Um, 